yet unwritten chapter in the long story of the intermingling of Canadian and American peoples is that which deals with theological education. Significantly, what was once the American Association of Theological Schools became in 1974 the Association of Theological Schools in the United States and Canada, the new name pointing to the realities of integration. Before someone can write the longer history, uh, the larger story, however, some particular studies, such as those dealing with Canadian-American relationships in theological education within specific denominational families, needs to be undertaken, in part because the boundary between the two nations has historically been relatively low, a point that's been made several times so far this week. There has been a great deal of movement back and forth, both of persons and of ideas. A preliminary glance early convinced me that the overall story is diffuse and complex. Even in trying to focus on one side of one denominational family's experience, that is, the influence of Canadians on Baptist theological education in the United States, I have found it most clarifying to concentrate upon what appears to be the central strand in an involved story and then to look briefly at some of the other strands. The central focus of this paper, therefore, is on the work of a group of 36 Baptists of Canadian background, and they're, those are the double-spaced uh, names on the page in front of me. The work of a group of 36 Baptists of Canadian background who spent significant portions of their careers as theological educators teaching or administering on a regular basis in seminaries related to what is named the American Baptist Churches in the USA, formerly the Northern and then the American Baptist Convention. How to define Canadian background is not always easy. Most of those in the basic group studied here were born and received much of their primary and secondary education, often also their theological education in Canada, but included uh, five who were born on the other side of the Atlantic, but who migrated to Canada and there received a substantial portion of their education. For completeness, I have included two persons who were Canadian born, but who received most or all of their education in the United States. When I first took on this assignment, I hypothesized that the influence of Canadians on American Baptist theological education was considerable. But I was really not prepared for the, ra the rather surprising story that has unfolded. And I have focused, I hope not too narrowly, on Canadian Baptist influence on Baptist theological education in the United States. Many persons have helped me in this undertaking, patiently responding to my letters of inquiry, but I wish to express thanks especially to Professor Winthrop S. Hudson, who with characteristic generosity helped me to clarify concepts and shape the preliminary list and to Dr. William H. Brackney, director of the American Baptist Historical Society, in the archives of which much of the research was done. What is presented here is only a beginning. Undoubtedly, some of you who hear these words and some of the persons mentioned are present in the audience, some of you who read and hear these words will be in a position to supply further information to make the story more correct and undoubtedly can supply corrections for some of the misstatements I may make. For the most part, this is a 20th century story, but there was one significant 19th century forerunner 
least that I've been able to identify so far. Charles Henry Corey, a native of New Brunswick, graduated from Acadia College in 1858 and from Newton Theological Institution three years later. After serving briefly in a pastorate in New Hampshire, he labored for the United States Christian Commission in the late months of the Civil War, and then accepted an appointment under the American Baptist Home Mission Society, organizing churches in South Carolina and Georgia. In 1868, he took up what was to be his life's main work in an institution that, after several changes of name, became the Richmond Theological Seminary. He served there as president and professor of theology and ethics until his death in 1899. As the central figure in a theological institution devoted to the theological education of blacks, his pioneering contribution was an important one. Shortly after his death, Richmond merged with another seminary in Washington to become Virginia Union University. He, as I say, was a 19th century forerunner. The rest of the rather lengthy dramatist personae uh, are 20th century figures. And my paper has five parts. You've heard the introduction, part one. In the early 20th century, a number of Canadian Baptists came to the United States for doctoral study. And far more than to any other one institution, they were drawn to the Divinity School of the University of Chicago, which until after mid-century was identified as a Baptist institution. Three of those who earned the PhD there were sooner or later called to the faculty, where they joined with several other Canadian Baptists to make a sizable and influential contingent. Alan Hoban, was born in New Brunswick. After graduation from that province's university, he studied at Newton Theological Institution and completed the PhD at the Divinity School of the University of Chicago in 1901. His thesis in New Testament studies was published as The Virgin Birth. After serving several churches in Wisconsin and Michigan, he taught homiletics and pastoral duties at the Divinity School for a decade. 1908 to 1919. Several years later, he became president of Kalamazoo College. The same year that Hoban joined the Chicago faculty, another theological scholar who had been born also in New Brunswick also joined the Chicago faculty. He was to remain for 30 years until his retirement in 1938 and to serve as dean during his last five years. Shirley Jackson Case earned several degrees at Acadia University, taught at the academy level in New Brunswick and then in New Hampshire, was ordained at the turn of the century, then won his B.D. and Ph.D. degrees at Yale, and after two years of teaching at Bates College, was called to the University of Chicago. There he labored in the fields of New Testament interpretation and the history of early Christianity. As chairman of the Department of Church History, he gathered a strong aggregation of historical scholars. A prolific researcher and author, he wrote nearly 90 articles and some 16 books, among them The Evolution of Early Christianity, The Social Origins of Christianity, and The Social Triumph of the Ancient Church. A determined exponent of the historical approach to the study of religion, his theological influence was strongly on the liberal side during his three decades uh, at the university. During his years there, the Canadian contingent on the faculty increased significantly. Archibald G. Baker was born in Ontario, educated at McMaster University, from which he received the A.B. in 1896 and the B.T.H. four years later. After service in several pastorates in Alberta and as a missionary in Bolivia under Canadian Baptist auspices, he came to Chicago for further study, 
completing the doctorate in 1920, and the next year beginning his teaching in the field of missions, a post he was to hold until retirement in 1940. His strongly liberal, if not humanistic, stance was disclosed in his magnum opus, Christian Missions and a New World Culture, 1934. But unlike several fellow Canadians who studied at Chicago, several fellow Canadian Baptists originally, who studied at Chicago and then joined its faculty, namely Albert Eustace Hayden and Peter G. Mode, he did not leave the Baptist fold. Charles T. Holman is one of our central group of 36 who was not born in Canada, but he came from his native England quite young, received his preparatory and collegiate education here, graduated from McMaster in 1910. He later undertook further study at the Divinity School of the University of Chicago, earning the BD in 1915. He then served several churches until in 1923 he took over some of the teaching responsibilities formerly done by Hoban in the area of pastoral duties at Chicago, later also becoming dean of the Baptist Divinity House. Much of his own work was in the field of counseling. His books include The Cure of Souls, The Religion of a Healthy Mind, and Getting Down to Cases. He taught at Chicago for nearly a quarter century, retiring in 1947. A colleague during almost uh, that same period was Ernest J. Shave, a native of Ontario. He earned several degrees at McMaster, served pulpits in British Columbia, and then in South Dakota. Graduate study at Chicago brought him a PhD in 1924. Two years later, he returned to teach in the field of religious education until his retirement in 1952. With primary interest in the area of progressive educational philosophy and method, he was very active in professional associations, wrote such books as The Supervision of Religious Education and A Functional Approach to Religious Education. Thus, for a period from the middle 1920s to the later 1930s, four Baptists of Canadian origin filled important posts at the Divinity School. The Canadian cast of the faculty in those years was further strengthened by Canadians of other denominations. Besides Hayden and Mood, I've already mentioned, there were also William C. Graham and William A. Irwin in Bible, and John T. McNeil in church history. Second part of the paper. The Divinity School of the University of Chicago has been discussed first, not only because of its intrinsic importance, but also because it was a principal source of theological educators for two American Baptist seminaries primarily devoted to the preparation of pastors. The Colgate Rochester Divinity School the merger in 1928 of Colgate and Rochester Theological Seminaries and Crozier Theological Seminary, which in 1970 left its campus in Chester, Pennsylvania, to become affiliated with Colgate Rochester at the latter's Rochester campus. The pioneer Canadian figure at Rochester Theological Seminary, who's been mentioned several times this week already, was its first dean of Rochester Theological Seminary, Joseph William Alexander Stewart. An 1876 graduate of the University of Toronto, this Ontarian continued his education in the theological department of Woodstock College. After serving three churches in Canada, he was called in 1887 to fill the pulpit of the First Baptist Church of Rochester. He discouraged the bid but finally yielded to pressure. Then in 1903, he began a 20-year period as Dean and Professor of Christian Ethics, Christian Ethics and Pastoral Theology at the Rochester Seminary. An able and competent man, he served as Acting President for three years following the retirement of Augustus H. Strong. 
During Dean Stewart's years at Rochester, the Canadian contingent grew. David Bovington was English-born, but came to Canada in 1890 and became and remained a devoted citizen of his adopted country, even through periods of service to the South. After study at Woodstock College, he received the BA from McMaster in 1899, was ordained that same year, served congregations in Ontario. He then went to Rochester for a BD, remained on as instructor in theology for some eight years, for a time assisting Dr. Strong. During part of that time, he continued his studies at the University of Chicago, receiving an MA in 1916. He then returned to the pastorate, finally, I mean primarily, in, on, in Ohio, with a short period as president of Brandon College. Now, although Burlington did not continue as a permanent member of the Rochester faculty, another group of Canadian Baptists, all of whom had studied at the Divinity School of uh, Chicago, did arrive on the Rochester scene and remained until death or retirement took them away. George Cross graduated from the University of Toronto in his native Ontario, took a pastorate while continuing his studies at McMaster. He transferred to Chicago and earned the PhD there in 1900. After teaching assignments at McMaster, where he taught church history when Albert H. Newman returned to the United States, and then at Newton Theological Institution, where he taught theology for three years, he was called in 1912 to Rochester to succeed Strong as professor of theology. A personally devout man who explained that, quoting him, so far as we can tell, the influence of Jesus more than any other has made us what we are, end quote. He insisted that theological study begin not with definitions or doctrines, but with facts and their interpretations, an approach that led some to call him an infidel. Among his books were The Theology of Schleiermacher, Creative Christianity, and Christian Salvation. His years of teaching were brought to a close by his death in 1929, 50 years ago. Soon after Cross came to Rochester, he was joined by Ernest W. Parsons, who had been born in England but migrated to Toronto at the age of 10. After earning four degrees at McMaster between 1899 and 1910, he was pastor uh, at Port Arthur for seven years uh, during some of that time. Earning the Ph.D. summa cum laude at the University of Chicago in 1912, he held several brief academic appointments until he was called to Rochester in the field of New Testament in 1914, where he taught until retirement 28 years later. The mature reflections of this loved teacher of the Bible can be found in his book, The Religion of the New Testament, 1939. In 1923, two other Canadians were added to that faculty, Frank O. Erb, secured his B.A. from the University of New Brunswick in his native province in 1900, but crossed the border for his theological education, studying first at Colgate and then at Rochester seminaries. Graduating from the latter in 1904, he served as pastor in Nova Scotia for five years and then undertook graduate study at the University of Chicago, earning the M.A., the B.D., and the Ph.D., in successive years, the latter magna cum laude in 1913. He became editor of youth publications for the American Baptist Publication Society and wrote a book entitled The Development of the Young People's Movement. His years as professor of religious education at Rochester extended from 1923 to his retirement in 1945. When John F. Vicker came to the Rochester faculty at the same time Herb did, he was already a seasoned theological educator. This native of Ontario, uh, Vickert, 
studied um, uh, earned three degrees at McMaster, including the BD in 1904. Studied for an additional year as fellow in church history at the University of Chicago, and then entered the pastoral ministry, serving churches in Manitoba, British Columbia, Indiana, and then Rhode Island. In 1915, he was called to be dean and professor of pastoral and systematic theology at the Colgate Theological Seminary. At a time when a number of seminaries were under fire because of their liberalism, he asserted the need for both an appreciation of the past and a search for new life. He reported that the seminaries, quoting him, are sanely radical and at the same time wisely conservative. In a way, his appointment anticipated the merger of Colgate and Rochester in 1928. After the merger, he continued on as professor of practical theology and supervisor of extramural work until his retirement in 1940. That merger brought still another Canadian into the picture, Thomas Waring. Like Parsons, Waring was English-born, but came to Canada as a boy and also earned four degrees at McMaster and then went on to secure a Ph.D. in Bible at Chicago in 1917. After serving as principal of Woodstock College, he became professor of New Testament at Colgate in 1923, the next year also becoming dean. In the move to Rochester, he became dean of the faculty and professor of Greek exegesis, retired in 1947. Now that merger thus meant that four major faculty posts were held by Canadians through the 1930s, a substantial minority on a relatively small faculty. So retirement soon diminished this number. In 1940, James D. Morrison was appointed as professor of preaching, serving there until his death 10 years later. Also from Ontario and educated at McMaster, he came to Rochester for his theological education and served in three American congregations until called to seminary teaching. Much concerned with worship and devotional aids, he edited the minister's service book and masterpieces of religious uh, verse. But only briefly, another Canadian played a role in Colgate-Rochester affairs, George Barton Cutton. This Nova Scotian took degrees at Acadia and Yale, where he earned both the Ph.D. and the B.D., filled pastorates in both Canada and the United States, and then was for 12 years president of Acadia University and for 20 years of Colgate University. During that latter period, when he was president of Colgate, the merger of Colgate Seminary with Rochester was worked out. And then for a period of just under a year, Cutton served as acting president of Colgate-Rochester, 1943 and 4, following his retirement from Colgate University. The story at, I'd like to sometime do a paper on the after career of Dr. Cutton. He became a specialist in um, silversmith, silversmith uh, work, and has written a number of pamphlets about the silversmith industry in various parts of uh, North America. The story at Crozier Theological Seminary in Chester, Pennsylvania, is surprisingly uh, similar. During the 1920s and 1930s, it had a number of Canadians on its faculty. The pioneer figure was Alva S. Hobart, a Prince Edward Islander who moved as a boy at the time of the death of his mother to live with his grandfather in Vermont, educated at what was then Madison University, later Colgate. He served several congregations and then was professor of English New Testament at Crozier from 1900 to 1920. A prolific author, Hobart wrote many books, among them an exposition of Ephesians entitled Transplanted Truths, also Pedagogy for Ministers, and Baptist Democracy. In the next few years after Hobart's retirement, no less than five Canadians, all but one, born in Ontario and educated at McMaster, and all of them recipients of a Ph.D. from the University of Chicago, joined the Crozier faculty. 
After completing his arts and theological degrees at McMaster, Isaac G. Matthews, about whom those of us at the symposium heard a bit this afternoon, ministered in British Columbia and then entered his controversial years, 1904 to 19, as professor of Old Testament language and literature at his alma mater, where he was the target of attack because of his liberal views. The Chicago Doctorate was completed in the middle of that period, in 1912. Leaving McMaster in 1919, he pastored a church in New Haven for a year and then climaxed his career as professor of Old Testament at Crozier from 1920 to 1942, 22 years. He wrote many books, among them How to Interpret Old Testament Prophecy and The Religious Pilgrimage of Israel. In 1922, another teacher of the Bible came to Crozier. Frederick O. Norton was a native of Prince Edward Island, studied at Prince of Wales College. But he continued his education at Transylvania College and the College of the Bible in Kentucky, a disciples school. Earned the Ph.D. at Chicago in 1906 and served as professor of New Testament and dean of the College of Liberal Arts at Drake University until 1922. His career as professor of New Testament literature and exegesis at Crozier was cut short by his untimely death in 1924. His book, The Rise of Christianity, was posthumously published. The career line followed by Stuart G. Cole is quite typical of many other Canadians who became professors in American seminaries. From arts, it's a familiar story now, from arts and theological degrees at McMaster to pastor and then doctoral study at Chicago, though he did not complete that degree until five years into his tenure at Crozer. From 1924 to 1936, he was professor of psychology and education there. After he left Crozer, he went into general educational administration. He wrote a number of books in his field such as character and Christian education, but is perhaps best known for his pioneer study, a revision of his doctoral dissertation, called The History of Fundamentalism, 1931. Because of his evident sympathy with liberalism, his work was criticized by the fundamentalists, who nevertheless acknowledged that he strove to be faithful to the facts and was honest in his approach. 1927, the Canadian contingent at Crozier was strengthened by the coming of Reuben E. E. Harkness. His route to professorship was also typical, from arts and theological training at McMaster to a doctorate at Chicago, meanwhile serving pastorates in Illinois and Wisconsin. His style of research and writing as professor of church history at Crozier from 1927 to 1950 led him to produce many articles and pamphlets. For many years, he edited The Chronicle, a Baptist historical quarterly predecessor of foundations. The professor of Christian theology at Crozier from 1930 until his untimely death in India in 1938 was Angus S. Woodburn. After graduation from McMaster, he served as a missionary to India under the Canadian Baptist Foreign Missionary Society. He returned to North America to complete D.D. and Ph.D. degrees at Chicago with a particular focus on the tensions between religion and science, as is shown in the title of his first of many books, The Relation Between Religion and Science, A Biological Approach. During the 1920s, he taught philosophy at Madras Christian College in the last period of his life, while teaching theology at the seminary, he was editor of the Crozier Quarterly. Now, if my researches are complete, and if not, I hope some of you will, will give me the material. The only Canadian at Crozier in more recent years was Lyle O. Bristol, professor of New Testament from 1954 to 1962, and dean for much of that time. A graduate of McMaster, he received an STM from Union Theological Seminary, and a Ph.D. at the University of Toronto. After serving congregations in both Canada and the United States, 
this native of Ontario, served briefly as dean of Eastern Baptist College before taking up the work at Crozier, which he left to return to the pastorate, uh, died, unfortunately, shortly after. He wrote many articles. Two books of his were posthumously published, Paul and Thessalonians and Hebrews, a commentary. Now, to review briefly the ground that's been surveyed thus far, the peak of Canadian influence in three divinity schools in the liberal tradition came in the 1930s. During most of that decade, four professors of Canadian Baptist background functioned in each of the institutions that have been discussed. The importance of the University of Chicago as an educator of theological educators is evident when it is remembered that all but one of those studied at the University of Divinity School, and that one exception taught there for 30 years. Now part three of the five parts. Theological educators of Canadian background, however, were divided broadly along the same liberal conservative lines that caused so much tension among both Canadian and American Baptists in the 20th century. And Canadian influences were also evident, evident in two seminaries initially founded to maintain a staunchly conservative theological uh, position. We had a little discussion of that uh, this afternoon. The first professor of Christian doctrine at Eastern Baptist Theological Seminary, founded in Philadelphia in 1925, was John B. Champion. A native of Prince Edward Island, Champion was educated at the University of New Brunswick and then went on to secure an MA at Acadia and a BD at Colgate. After a series of pastorates in both countries, Champion became, uh, began his professorial career with the founding of the new seminary, earning a PhD three years later. He is especially remembered for his work on the doctrine of the atonement. An early book was entitled The Living Atonement, and during his 16 years at Eastern, he wrote a number of works, among them More Than Atonement, a study in genetic theology, and personality and trinity. He taught a theory of the atonement which emphasized what he called the personal point of view in contrast to more mechanical conceptions. And he did not hesitate to use among textbooks he recommended those by theologians who openly accepted the results of biblical criticism. Also involved in Easton's founding and development was Arthur E. Harris. Born in Montreal, his early career was in business. He then attended Crozier Seminary, graduating in 1903, and served various churches in the Northeast. Called as one of the original faculty members at Easton, Harris taught in the field of English Bible and served as registrar until 1938, formally retired. He continued on as director of extension for another dozen years. Author of Bible Books Outlined and The Household of Faith, Harris also published a book of poems. Very influential in Easton's development was its second president, who began his 10-year term just a year, 10-year term, just a year after the founding of the school. Austin K. Du Bois, a native of Wolfville, who graduated from Acadia, went to Newton for his theological education, earned a Ph.D. from Brown University in 1889, carried on further study in Germany. After pastorates in the Maritimes and in the United States, he filled terms as vice principal of Union Baptist Seminary uh, in New Brunswick and as president of Shirtliff College in Illinois. The author of many books, while at Eastern, he wrote or edited a number of others, including Evangelism in the New Age and The Church of Today and Tomorrow. A conservative in theology, Du Bois was an open-minded man who stressed high scholarly standards and who urged ministers to read on both sides of current controversies. 
After these three Canadians had completed their terms of service, it was not until the 1960s that the Canadian President's Canadian presence was renewed at Easton, and the seminary twice called on sons of the neighbor to the north as presidents. The first was Thomas B. McDormand, who has recently been seen in these parts, a native of Nova Scotia and graduate of Acadia with distinction. He managed, while in pastorates and denominational posts, to earn a B.D. at St. Stephen's College in Edmonton and a Ph.D. at Emmanuel College, Toronto. After serving as General Secretary of the Baptist Federation of Canada and briefly as Executive Vice President of this university, he was called to Eastern as President in 1961, serving for six years before returning to Canada. Something of the tone of his administration at Eastern can be glimpsed in his inaugural address, in which he stressed the complementarity of religion and democracy, of natural and revealed theology of science and religion. Among his many writings are The Art of Building Worship Services, Evangelism and a Saving Faith for Modern Man, and Concordance to Hymns. The year after McDormand returned to Canada, the seminary called another Nova Scotian to the presidency of Easton. J. Lester Harnish, however, had spent most of his early years in Boston and attended Wheaton College and Eastern Seminary. A permanent pastor on both East and West Coasts, Harnish was president of the American Baptist Convention in 1964 and 65, and following his four years at Easton, returned to the pastorate. He wrote The Harvest of the Spirit, co-authored the Prepare and Preach, and also was involved in the work How to Be a Saint While Flat on Your Back. The Canadian influence, Canadian influence at Eastern continues today in the person of D. George Vanderlip, since 1971, professor of English Bible. Born in the Netherlands, Vanderlip came to Canada in his early youth, graduated from McGill in 1949. He earned several theological degrees at Fuller Theological Seminary and a PhD at the University of Southern California, and taught successively at California and Northern seminaries before going to Eastern. Among other books, he's written Jesus, Teacher, and Lord, Paul and Romans, and just this year, John, the Gospel of Life. Now, these six theological educators of Canadian background, as I've defined it, three of them much involved in the original shaping of the school, and three of them as presidents have been obviously influential in Eastern's life. The Northern Baptist Theological Seminary in Chicago was founded earlier than Easton. As far as I have been able to discover, the Canadian influence began in 1946 with Warren C. Young, a Prince Edward Islander who received his undergraduate education at Gordon College and went on to earn a doctorate at Boston University in 1946, and two years later, a BD at Northern. His career of more than three decades has been invested in teaching theology and Christian philosophy. He's written a book entitled A Christian Approach to Philosophy. His colleague for some 15 years was Douglas C. Stevens. A native of Ontario, Stevens was educated at McMaster, but went to Northern for his B.D. and Ph.D. degrees, remaining on to teach biblical languages and Old Testament until late in the 1960s, when he shifted to Moody Bible Institute. Dr. Vanderlip's presence at Northern has already been mentioned. He served from 1960 to 1971 on the faculty, the last five of those years also as dean. But Professor Young, who represents Canadian continuity on the Northern faculty, now has two other colleagues from the North, Eric H. Ullman, a native of Alberta and a graduate of its university, earned his B.D. at Northern, and then after study uh, at, at Hamburg and then at Louisville, completed his Ph.D. in the Graduate Theological 
Union in Berkeley in 1973. Two years before that, he had already begun his teaching at Northern in the field of church history. Another Albertan, Gerald L. Borchert, came to, Northern, to the Northern faculty in 1977 as professor of New Testament, academic dean, and vice president. The holder of both art and law degrees from the University of Alberta, he earned an MDiv at Eastern and a PhD at Princeton Theological Seminary. Among his books is a recent one entitled Dynamics of Evangelism. So without the concentration of Canadian resources, especially in the 1930s, which was evident in the first three seminaries discussed, the Canadian influence has been significant at Eastern and Northern, particularly in more recent decades. Part four. At other American Baptist seminaries, the number of Baptist faculty members of Canadian background has been much smaller. Though many, well over 200, I suspect it is well over that figure, Canadian students have studied at Newton Theological Institution since the merger of 1931, the Andover Newton Theological School. Not many Canadians taught there. It's already been mentioned that George Cross did for three years before going to Rochester. Then for about four years in the 1940s, Joseph C. Rabin served as director of evangelism and church relations. In Nova Scotia, he had been educated at Brown and Newton. Robbins was long conspicuous in the missionary life of the Northern Baptist Convention. After laboring in the Philippines, he was foreign secretary of the American Baptist Foreign Mission Society for more than a quarter century. While at Andover Newton, he served as president of the Northern Baptist Convention. More recently, Wallace Forby was at Andover Newton for more than a dozen years, 1954-67, as director of field work and professor of pastoral theology. A 1926 graduate of Acadia University, Forby completed his theological education at Newton and filled the pulpit of the First Baptist Church of Charlestown, Massachusetts, before undertaking his faculty responsibilities at the seminary. Some Canadians of other denominational backgrounds have taught at Andover Newton, for example, Gerald Craig, S. McLean Gilmore, and John Van Cedars. At Berkeley Baptist Divinity School, now the American Baptist Seminary of the West, several theological educators, both natives of Ontario, who were educated at McMaster and earned doctorates at the University of Chicago, moved into central administrative posts for overlapping three-year terms. A biblical scholar, Robert J. Arnott, was called from the pastor to the presidency of Berkeley in 1964. A year later, Arthur L. Foster came to the school as vice president, dean, and professor of theology and personality. Arnott left in 1967 to join the faculty of the Claremont School of Theology and Foster departed the following year to take a position at Chicago Theological Seminary. At Central Baptist Theological Seminary in Kansas City, Kansas, Alvin C. Porteous taught as professor of theology from 1961 to 1971. A native of Ontario, Porteous graduated from, graduated from McMaster, earned an MA at the University of Toronto, and received his doctorate from Union Theological Seminary in New York in 1957, while serving pastor in the vicinity. He was called to Central from a teaching post at Linfield College, and following his decade at Kansas City, taught three years at Emory University, and then returned to the pastorate, where, among other things, he did some part-time teaching at Andover Newton. He is the author of Prophetic Voices in Contemporary Theology, The Search for Christian Credibility, and just this year, preaching to suburban captives. Now, before attention is shifted to several other matters related to the topic of this paper, a few reflections on the ground that has been covered are in order. Clearly, the contribution of Baptists of Canadian background to American Baptist theological education, especially five of them, 
has been very important. The period of greatest concentration was in the 1930s, when nearly half of the group of 36 that has been considered were active in four seminaries. The versatility and productivity of that group was on the whole remarkable. It was represented in all the main departments of theological study and produced an impressive library of writings. I've mentioned only a few of the available titles. Many of these theological educators played forthright roles in the theological controversies of their time. The predominance of influence was on the liberal side, but conservatives were ably represented. Most of them also were active in parish and denominational, as well as educational affairs. As we who are American Baptists review our history, we have reason to be grateful for their leadership. As one who happens to have met, and in some cases to have known very well, nearly two-thirds of that group of 36, it is perhaps not inappropriate for me as an American Baptist to express appreciation for their many contributions. Now part five. Attention has been focused primarily on the Canadian Baptist influence on American Baptist seminaries. Much more research remains to be done uh, to follow up the topic as to seminaries of other Baptist conventions. But preliminary inquiries do not seem to suggest any such impact as has been described. Among Southern Baptist seminaries, New Orleans had on its faculty in the 1960s two professors of Canadian identification who are both parts of our symposium this week, Samuel L. Mikulansky, born in Yugoslavia and later naturalized as a Canadian citizen. Graduated from the University of Western Ontario and then earned B.B. and B. Phil degrees at London, England, and Oxford, respectively. He served on the New Orleans faculty as theologian from 1960 to 1969. During the last four of those years, one of his colleagues in the teaching of theology was Clark H. Pinnock. A graduate of the University of Toronto, Pinnock received the PhD from the University of Manchester. After leaving New Orleans, he taught at Trinity Seminary in Deerfield, Illinois, before returning to Canada to his present post. A third Canadian who joined the New Orleans Theological Seminary faculty in 1968 George L. Kelm continues the Canadian tradition there. He won all his earned degrees at the American Institution and teaches in the field of biblical introduction and archaeology. So far, I have been able to locate one other Southern seminary in which Canadians have taught over a long period of time, Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas. The pioneer figure was Calvin Goodspeed, who had studied at McMaster and Newton and taught theology at Southwestern from 1905 to 1909. Serving on that faculty now is a Nova Scotian who received all his collegiate and graduate education in the United States, J.W. McGorman, who has been teaching New Testament there for more than 30 years. There has been considerable influence of persons of Canadian Baptist background, however, on two seminaries of smaller Baptist conventions. Five such persons have been on the staff of North American Baptist Seminary in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, a seminary associated with the North American Baptist General Conference, a body of German background. Three of them, who served for varying periods of time from 1963 to 1967, taught in the biblical field. Gerald Borchert, now at Northern, Benjamin Bright Cruz, and Arthur Patsia. Donald, L. Donald N. Miller was Vice President for Development in the earlier 1970s. Dr. Nikolaski has been associated with the seminary since 1974. At Bethel Theological Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota, associated with the Baptist General Conference of America, 
a body of Swedish background, two natives of Saskatchewan are now serving. Norris A. Magnuson has been active there since 1959 as librarian and church historian. And Leland Eliasson has taught since 1973 in pastoral care and field education. In the fall of 1979, Afapatsia returned to seminary teaching, this time at Bethel from a pastorate in Vancouver. Now, another aspect of this overall topic which needs further study is the role of Canadian Baptists who taught at other than Baptist seminaries, perhaps those especially who were at non-denominational or interdenominational seminaries which had Baptists in their student bodies. No doubt the most conspicuous on this list would be Douglas C. McIntosh, a Baptist from Ontario. He was educated at McMaster, did some teaching there and at Brandon, completed the Ph.D. at the University of Chicago in 1910. That same year, he began a notable teaching career at Yale Divinity School that continued until his retirement in 1942. Incidentally, he almost didn't make it. Uh, as he was headed across the border, an immigration official heard that he was going to be permanently employed in the United States and gave him a hard time. Until in the course of the conversation, Dr. McIntosh happened to mention he was going to be teaching at Yale. At that point, the official waved him through and said, oh, you're going to teach? I thought you were going to work. <laughs> uh, he even did write it down, which caused uh, uh, Dr. McIntosh great difficulty in later years. He determined after teaching for more than two decades that he should be naturalized, and uh, there was no record of his being in the United States at all uh, from the official point of view. He had to leave and come back again. McIntosh is remembered as one of the most thought-provoking members of the Yale faculty in those years. In him, the tension between the Enlightenment and pietism continued to inform and creatively to trouble his teaching as he worked out an empirical theology while committed to the life of faith. He wrote many important books, among them The Problem of Knowledge, Theology as an Empirical Science, The Reasonableness of Christianity, The Pilgrimage of Faith in the World of Modern Thought. He was the center of a famous court battle, in 1929, a United States District Court in Connecticut denied him American citizenship because he refused to promise to bear arms in an unjust war. The Circuit Court of Appeals granted the citizenship, however, only to have the United States Supreme Court, in one of its 5-4 decisions, finally deny that citizenship in 1931. Another Baptist to teach at a non-denominational school was Mary A. Tully, who taught in the field of religious education for 20 years at Union Theological Seminary in New York, my colleague. A British Columbian who taught in elementary and secondary schools there and was then involved in Baptist educational work in the West. She came east and earned three degrees at Columbia University's Teachers College and in 1951 began her work at Union. During her years there, she became deeply interested in art, winning a professional diploma in fine arts and art education. After retirement, Dr. Tully continued to do some part-time teaching at Andover Newton. Currently, Peter J. Paris, a holder of two degrees from Acadia University, who earned a doctorate at the University of Chicago, is teaching in the field of sociology of religion in the Divinity School of Vanderbilt University. Now to sum up. In order to deal with the topic of this paper in specific rather than in general terms, I have focused on that group of Baptists of Canadian background who served on a regular basis in faculty or administrative posts of seminaries of American Baptist churches. And then I've commented much more briefly on some other members of the Baptist denominational family. Before the whole topic can be definitively treated, however, 
Some other considerations will need to be more fully investigated. Some American Baptist theological educators received either their university or seminary training in Canada. What has been the influence of this on their work? A number of ministers and laypersons of Canadian background have served on seminary boards. Austin Du Bois, for example, in his years in the pastorate, served on the boards of the Divinity School of the University of Chicago and of Newton Theological Institution. And a careful search would no doubt turn up many others. Active ministers also served as part-time instructors on seminary faculties. A notable example was Robert J. McCracken's instruction at Union while he was minister of the Riverside Church. The Canadian influence at Union was also felt through the influence of several distinguished Canadians of other denominations, particularly John T. McNeil, James D. Smart. Another question. What has been the impact on theological education in the United States of Baptist Americans who have taught in Canadian educational institutions? A beginning list that includes such names as William Newton Clark, George Berman Foster, Albert Henry Newman, Nathaniel H. Parker, Gerald P. Albaugh, and to bring it down to date, M. R. Cherry, Paul R. Dekar, Joseph D. Ban. And what influence on theologi theological education did the many Canadian students who attended American Baptist seminaries have, both in their student days and in the years that followed? Some, as we have seen, became faculty members or administrators, where their impact was direct. One suspects that others, active in denominational life, were certainly not without influence in various ways. Now, what has been considered in this paper, which is really a, a report of research in progress, what has been considered is but one section of a longer chapter on the interrelationships in theological education between Canada and the United States of America. It may be that the Baptist story told here in a preliminary way is unique, but parallel studies of Roman Catholicism, Presbyterianism, Methodism, Congregationalism, the United Churches, Anglicanism, Lutheranism, and others can round out and complete the larger history, a significant aspect of the educational histories of these two North American countries.